But let's make a change. Today on Twin Cam, we're taking our first real dive into the world of the modern car. And alongside me, I have a car that was a bit of a new pretender in the hot hatch market when it launched in 2017, the Hyundai i30N. And over the past five years, this car has really held its own against its much more established competition. In fact, the i30N can be seen as the beginning of a very different Hyundai. N, not a letter you traditionally associate with performance, but in this setting it stands for two things. Namyang, Hyundai's test facility in South Korea, and the Nürburgring, where Hyundai's European technical centre lies. But the N story begins with the letter before, M. As if they weren't already before, BMW became the kings of the performance saloon in the 80s and 90s with a string of brilliant M cars. And from the development of the E30 M3 in the mid 80s all the way through to the mid 2010s, a certain Albert Biermann was a critical part of making M cars so special. So the world was a little shocked when in 2016, Hyundai stole him away to head their new performance brand. And despite not being a particular specialist in front drive, Herr Biermann was handed the all new i30 and set to work on forging a new story from scratch. This car's only been around for five years, but it's already clear to see that this was the start of a dynasty of Hyundais that are a bit leery and the beginnings of Hyundai is a company that makes genuinely cool cars. Because before the i30N, the closest we got to a cool Hyundai were the original run of coupes and the Genesis, a car that's barely noteworthy in the UK. But since the i30N, we've had the i20N and the Ionic 5, by far my favourite EV. We're about to get the Ionic 6 as well, which proves to all manufacturers that you don't need to make cookie cutters of different sizes. You can make different looking cars for each segment. And then there are the concepts, all of which look brilliant. And we've just had the drool-worthy Envision 74. They're absolutely nailing it, and long may that continue. But away from the road cars for a second, because N is also a name that now has genuine rally pedigree behind it, as Hyundai won back-to-back -back World Rally Championships in 2019 and 2020. So back to the i30N, and of course this car is still being produced. It may have been facelifted a few years ago, but there is a fair chance that some of you watching might be considering buying one of these brand new. So let's have a little game of top trumps. A new i30N performance with the optional performance blue paintwork is £34,680. Very close to this is the Ford Focus ST, though Ford won't actually let you configure one at the moment, but the Focus starts at £34,960. Then we can move on to the traditionally premium marks and BMW, because their 128Ti is one of the more intriguing and interesting new hot hatches, reviving the company's traditional performance moniker, but it is only available with an automatic gearbox, and to bring it up to the Hyundai standard, we need metallic paint, leather seats, and the comfort pack. So one of these would set you back £39,415. A Volkswagen Golf GTI doesn't come with much as standard, so we need to add metallic paint, 19-inch wheels, the winter pack, dynamic chassis control, and leather seats, and that means a Golf is £41,175. Much like the BMW, the Mercedes AMG A35 isn't available with a wand, so paddles will have to do. And it has four-wheel drive, putting it ahead of the competition mechanically. And with metallic paint, yours for £42,165. As for the Honda Civic Type R, well, the new one was shown off the day after I recorded this video. 
But as of yet, we don't quite know enough about it to be able to compare it to this lot. But for the ones you can get, we have five hot hatches, and all have five doors, and all have four cylinder turbocharged engines. So our Hyundai is by far the cheapest, and that's with a fair amount of standard equipment too. But compare it to the archetypal hot hatch, the Golf GTI, and it's a staggering six and a half grand cheaper. So where does that come from? Is it in the performance? Well, what I can say is that it certainly doesn't feel like it. Because under here is a 2-litre variant of Hyundai's really long-running theta engine. And they've kept it updated through the years and engineered this TGDI version, especially for the i30N. It has all the usual 16 valves, direct injection, variable intakes and valve timing, but it has a much bigger turbocharger. And that means that in this pre-facelift i30N performance, it produces 275 brake horsepower and 260 pound-feet of torque. But before we get to some actual driving, drive modes. Now I have the car sat in economy and we can control seven different parameters. The throttle response, the rev matching, the differential, if we go over to chassis, the dampers, the steering, and the stability control. And finally, the exhaust. Because this thing sounds immense. And the beauty of having this kind of control is that you can have the best of both worlds. You can have a car that sounds relatively normal, or you can have absolute turbo nutter mode that wakes up the neighbors and sounds fantastic. So let's select N mode. And you can hear already maybe, the engine has turned up, we have a different note, and now even the idle has become slightly antisocial. And let's see what Namyang's idea of a performance car is like. Because this noise is all you need to tell you that this is a thoroughly serious bit of kit. is ridiculous. The exhaust is by far the most obvious part of the car externally. It's ridiculous and they seem to have tuned it to sound really lumpy even on idle. So it sounds like it's got a ridiculous camshaft in it. Although it doesn't, it's a modern car of course, but it sounds like it's got some ridiculous racing cam in it. license in this very easily. And on the overrun, it cackles and pops at you like the anti-lag system in an old turbocharged rally car. And I suppose this does have rally pedigree. What a fabulous thing. The attitude is muffled by the turbocharger, but you can still feel it even as we're pottering around now, just at 30 miles per hour. We're in end mode, but the exhaust is still there. This is all very entertaining, but I can't quite decide whether this is just very entertaining or whether I'm actually enjoying it. It makes its falsalinness very, very apparent. This engine doesn't sing, it shouts. But I suppose that's what modern engines and turbocharging does to a four-cylinder engine. But you can hear, which is brilliant. Hopefully we'll get it when we turn it to here now. When we come on boost. Apart from it scrambling for grip, probably hear it more if we're going to fifth. You can hear a little shoo from the turbocharger as it starts to spool up. <laughs> oh, the wheel spin in third gear! My God! Oh, 
Oh, it scraggles, but it really does hold on. Wow. How on earth am I going so quickly already? And through this six-speed manual gearbox, those power figures translate to 60 miles per hour in 6.1 seconds and onto a top speed of 155 miles per hour. But nobody really does that. Not in the real world anyway, because you can't do that on British roads. Um, because first of all, um, you'll have your license taken away. And second of all, you'll end up in a tree. But let's drop a few cogs with automatic rev matching, which is cool. See what this engine can do, and there's 60 miles per hour already from virtually a standstill. Modern cars, eh? Why you would actively need anything quicker than this in a hot hatch, I do not know. Should we try that again? I think we should try that again. Oh, wheel spin is second gear. Oh, wow. And on the dashboard in front of me, I have shift lights as well. So everything, it just seems so properly designed. All those little touches that come together to make it feel a really well considered package rather than just a huge engine shoved in a very normal family hatchback. These are the bits that separate it. These are the bits that actually make it good and worthwhile. I'm going to heel and toe, but I don't need to because I've got the rev matching to do it for me. So this six speed gearbox, I don't know the history behind it, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was completely different to the one in the standard i30 because it feels like a proper sports car gearbox. Six speeds, of course, very long ratios, very long ratios. And it's very, very snappy. Um, it's not a particularly slick gear change, but it is very, very accurate. It's got a very, very short throw on it too. It's a lovely box to use, really lovely. You know, I'm not overly bothered about performance because already this is scarily quick. But every time you depress the throttle pedal, it feels as though the engine is trying to rip the drive shafts out of the hubs. It just feels so powerful. Oh, I've just noticed as well, when the turbo really comes on boost, you get a little green kind of snail next to it that tells you it's on boost. Not only that, you can hear it's on boost. about it too is that once you do get it on boost which does come very quickly but you can feel it building up uh, and then you can hear it come on boost but once it does get on boost it's so incredibly linear anywhere within the rev range once you've depressed the throttle pedal and it just shoots absolutely shoots if I'm honest, this is the first big hot hatch of this generation that I've driven. And frankly, I don't see where the genre goes from here in terms of power delivery. Yes, four wheel drive, absolutely. But this theta lump just delivers both orally and physically. It just delivers. You just put your foot down and you have to wait for it to build up the boost slightly. You know, 500 RPM maybe, for it to build up the boost, but once it does, it just shoots off. Within two seconds, you're at the speed limit. And while we're here, I just want to mention the rev match. See, just there, the rev matching. When it works, it's brilliant, but sometimes, like just then, it doesn't rev match. And so, you shift down a gear, I jump off the clutch pedal expecting the revs to have been matched and it doesn't do it. So maybe before when I was healing and towing, 
mainly by accident, just out of force of habit, maybe I should keep doing it. The rev matching is definitely turned on, it says there. But sometimes it doesn't actually do its job. I think I've sold the rev matching now. Um, it's not as quick as I would be. I mean, to be fair, it's got to figure out that you are trying to change down gears. So it, it's, it's got to have that realisation in it in the first place. But what you got to do is you've just got to take ever so slightly longer with your gear changes. So I am now in fifth. If I go down to fourth, you just take that just millisecond extra before letting the clutch out. So it knows it's gone down to fourth gear, but it's yet to engage the gear. So all I need to do there is to figure out, ah, you're changing down. So I need to rev match. Just need to take that tiny bit extra time. No doubt I could rev match quicker on my own, but that's only because I know I'm changing down. The car needs to be told it's changing down. So I'm rather impressed by the end's straight line abilities, but the facelift bumped that power figure up to 280 horsepower and the torque quite a bit further to 289 pound feet. So in our little game of top trumps, how does that stack up against the competition? Well, let's carry our same order as before, so our next car is the Focus, and Uncle Henry's finest does have an extra 300cc in its favour, but it too has a nice round 280 brake horsepower, and a little bump up from the Hyundai on torque with 310 pound feet. Moving up by nearly 5 grand and we have the automatic BMW. The TI is back level with the N on 2000cc, but down at only 261 brake horsepower. But there is 295 pound feet of torque to play with. The Golf, comparatively, mustn't really be able to move, because it only produces 245 brake horsepower and 273 pound feet of torque. But the AMG steals the show. As though it is the most expensive, its 2 litre engine makes a dizzy 306 brake horsepower and 295 pound feet of torque. And thanks to the four wheel drive system and automatic gearbox, it can sprint to 60 miles per hour over a second quicker than any of the others. So if going quickly is your thing, then the Mad Merc is the one to have. But I don't think I'd bother. Not just because it's a seven and a half grand premium, but because the ENDS power plant feels raucous enough. And on UK public roads, I don't think you'd ever really use that extra 25 horsepower. But away from the facts and figures and on to the subjective bits. Because I remember when this car came out five years ago. And subjectively, a lot of people had a hard time in processing the existence of a Hyundai hot hatch. Never mind one that could actually compete. So before we get on to anything else, we need to discuss the foremost feature, the batch. Anyone who's ever questioned the i30N, not on its ability, but on its badge, is not a car enthusiast. They're a brand enthusiast. And I've seen some serious journalists who won't question a German car of this price bracket, but will a Korean one. Now, I'm not a Hyundai enthusiast by any stretch of the imagination, though I do appreciate the things that they've been doing of late. But the point of variety is in giving everything its fair test, so let's start with the styling. The standard i30 is a decent looking car, especially considering some of the stylistic beigeness that Hyundai has pumped out over the decades. But it is still rather anonymous. Fortunately for us, however, the changes brought to the end not only add a new dimension, but pick out some of the features lost on the basic car. In profile, it has a chunkiness, and that's thanks to the pinches in the bodywork being moved as close to the sills and window line as possible. It's a low enough car not to look plain in between, so your focus is brought to these swages and their location. The glass house isn't too small as to make it impractical, and so its pinching towards the rear end is subtle. And it's a combination of these two features that give the car this chunkiness. It's a trait shared with the 1 Series and, to a lesser extent, the A-Class. But the i30 is a little more subtle in its execution, and doesn't look as though it's trying too hard to be a stylistic statement. 
From the front though, there is a bit more aggression and intent, with the headlamps and grille snarling at you without going over the top. Marking it out from normality are a few vents and a red tip splitter. Again, I think this is just about enough, not over the top and certainly not bland. The rear end is where we get the closest to stylistic excess, because it's here that the end shows off a bit of rally car imitation. First is the big spoiler. This one's not standard, but it isn't at all far from the factory item, so it's still comparable. And it hoods the rear window, making the rear end appear more vertical, like a rally car. And extending that depth is a huge rear bumper, with a fake diffuser, more red striping and two lovely exhausts. But it's the depth of it, the slashes in it, and the mini strakes in the rear quarters that scream rally car. I'm really rather a fan. So we've established that it's quite quick and that it's a rather handsome thing, but I've been comparing it to BMWs, Volkswagens and Mercedes, so I'm sure to a lot of you watching, the question of interior quality might explain the difference in price. But first, practicality. This is a hot hatch, so besides going very quickly, it also needs to be able to swallow a family. And oh dear. The boot itself is actually a decent size, but someone has put a strut brace in here. So unless you want to compromise rigidity or do a bit of DIY, you can't really fit big items in here when you fold the back seats down. But in the back, I don't think anyone would really complain here. There's loads and loads of space in front of me. Uh, my feet sit underneath the seat as well, and that's a seat set for me. And there's a decent amount of headroom as well. Now, it is very dark in here because the headlining's black. It's got tinted windows and the upholstery is all black. So it feels grim, but it's actually trimmed really rather nicely. The seats are half Alcantara, half leather, and you've got this performance blue um, contrast stitching everywhere. You get things like an armrest with cup holders in it, you get little storage nets, and you get a door bin as well. So it's all really rather lovely back here. But in the business end, things really begin to rather hot up. Because although it is very, very dark in here, it's very, very tastefully designed and built. So, obviously I've mentioned the back seats, but the front seats are a little bit buckety. They're very, very well sculpted. Not buckety enough to hold you in place, but just to give you the support where you need it. They are quite comfortable. They're firm enough to make it feel sporty, but not firm enough to make it feel uncomfortable. And all the plastics in here are of a reasonably high quality. There are places where the quality is really high. So like on the top of the dashboard here, this is all very, very soft. And then there are places where it's a little bit scratchier, like on the centre console here, that's a bit cheaper. But generally, everything is at least acceptable towards being very good. It all feels very solidly designed and very solidly assembled as well. Then you've got things like the buttons. So again, there are bits that are average, and there are things that are way above average. So you've got things that look quite nice, like these little heater vent sliders here, but they feel bang average, really. And then you've got the climate buttons here, which are a little bit cheap, coated in piano black as well, which isn't great, um, but they're acceptable at least. And then you've got things that feel of a much higher quality. So the buttons down at the bottom here, they feel of a very high quality. The window switches feel perfectly good, of a decently high quality. And the buttons on the steering wheel as well, they feel of a high quality. So again, at least everything is at least average quality going up towards very good. So I've already mentioned the seats and the half leather Alcantara, but there are other little bits of leather dotted about as well. So there is, of course, the leather on the centre console, again, with that contrasting stitching, which is lovely, and around the steering wheel, again, stitching around the inside. And the performance blue is replicated again on the drive mode buttons on the steering wheel that we looked at before. And in front of us, thank you, are a set of proper analogue instruments. And they look fabulous, lit up in their ambient blue lighting with the bright red needles. And Albert Beerman brought a little bit of the old M car into this interior as well, because you have the amber 
soft red line limiters for before the engine warms up like you used to have in an E46 M3 for example. It even has oil temperature, torque and boost gauges in the centre screen. But the main screen is a bit more hit and miss because it does really look as though it's just been plonked on there and you feel a little bit of the creaky plasticness, not that you're going to ever be doing that realistically in a car, but it does look plonked on. And I remember back in 2017, this looked fine. Um, but now in 2022, the screen looks a little bit small and maybe the system looks ever so slightly clunky. But it does have Apple CarPlay and, Play and Android Auto. And if you did want a bigger screen, the facelifted car has a much bigger screen with a new system on it. And fortunately, the facelift didn't ruin what this interior did well at the start. And that's having everything laid out in a sensible, intuitive manner. So the climate controls have their own individual place here at the bottom of the dashboard and they still do on the facelift car. So you have your individual knobs for your temperature and a big row of buttons at the bottom. None of this stupid putting all this kind of stuff in the screen where it's unintuitive, a faff, brakes all the time as well if it's a Volkswagen, and is actually dangerous when you're driving a car. This is done right and thank goodness they haven't got rid of that. And I've been making great use of this automatic climate control today because it is sweltering. It's the hottest day ever recorded in Great Britain. And so I'm going to be putting this aircon on very high. Aesthetically and in terms of user friendliness is the last place that I can compare the five cars because I just haven't driven the rest. One day, maybe, but for now, there's one factor that I find to be the end's biggest drawback. The ride quality is appalling. We're meant to be under the belief that modern technology has solved suspension. It's done. But not so if this is Hyundai's idea of a performance car. I'll get onto the steering, handling, and control in a moment, but for now, the ride is ridiculously jiggly. It just finds every little difference in surface in the road, every tiny little pothole, every little ridge in the road, and it just translates it straight into the bottom of my spine. It's completely unlivable. And this proper turbo nutter N mode has to be for track use only, because I couldn't live with this on a day-to-day -day basis, it's rubbish. So, I have set N custom mode that I've just gone into now, and I've set the suspension to normal. So the dampers should now have softened off, and already I can feel that instead of kind of skipping over bumps and between all the bumps and trying to pull me and drag me places, the car is now gliding a little bit more easily across the surface. I can still feel everything, it's still firm, but it's no longer uncomfortable. So I think if you're gonna get one of these, don't drive it in end mode, drive it in end custom and put the suspension on normal because this is just ridiculous. So while we've been discussing comfort, we might as well start talking about refinement as well. And I'm sat in traffic now, I'm in a 40 doing 33 miles per hour. And at this speed, it's fine. I can hear the exhaust a little bit in end mode, that's quite cool but it's fine, everything's very refined. But once you get over 40 miles per hour, as I'm about to get up to now, as this car turns away, so as we get up to 40, and there we are, it starts humming at you. There's a ridiculous amount of road noise from this car. And of course, the basic i30, I'd guess, wouldn't have this same problem, because I can tell here that the wind noise is very dampened out, the engine noise is very dampened out, the exhaust is what you can hear, the engine is barely making any noise. Just about hear that turbocharger, as I've said, but apart from that, it's all very refined. But it starts humming at you. The road noise is ridiculous, and I suppose that's what you get from having huge 19-inch wheels and very low-profile tyres. But if this is what a modern hot hatch is like, then frankly, I'd rather have a hot hatch from the 90s that had actual compliance and would still go very quickly, but wouldn't want to deafen you with road noise at the same time. And it would probably be comfier as well.
Well, the trade-off is that we get a car with an incredible composure on twisty roads. It is very firm, but of course, when you're pushing on a bit, that can become a good thing. The i30N has my first instructor at the front and a multi-link system at the back. All pretty standard for a modern hot hatch, you might say. But it also has the strut brace in the back. It also has very sticky 235-35 R19 tyres and of course 19-inch alloys. And it has an electronically controlled limited slip differential. Wow. And there's a curb weight of just over 1,500 kilos. And despite the power, the electric power steering, it feels so communicative. So communicative, actually. With the steering um, weightened up in end mode, it really, really comes to life because it's not just doesn't just have a little bit of weight to it, but it also has delicacy to it. As I go down this road, it's kind of wriggling between my fingers. I can feel what the car is wanting to do at absolutely every second. And the beauty of that is that it's giving me a thorough amount of confidence in a car that I've been driving for 15 minutes. Well, that does indicate as well that maybe it's not absolutely perfect because the fact that it's wriggling through my fingers says that it's not absolutely composed. It, f it gives me a sense of composure through it because it tells me what it's doing. But I prefer this. I prefer the car to be able to tell me what it's doing, to communicate how it's moving across the road surface, as opposed to me being able to just hold the steering wheel in a straight line and it just to go down, the, down a road. Another thing it doesn't quite do right it's the tramping. Because, and this is a thing that a lot of people have said about these cars, when you are coming out of a corner and you go to put the power on, as you do, you always have to in one of these. When you go and put the power on, you can feel that there is a wheel tramping at the front. It's not happy with all the power being put through it. And that is a little, you know, it does relate a little bit back to the point I made earlier about the fact that it feels like the engine is trying to rip a drive shaft out of a hub. And it could control that a bit better. But I think it's fun. I, I think that's really, really endearing and quite engaging in a car that as you pull out of a corner, it doesn't just do exactly as it's told. It starts to tell you that it's misbehaving slightly, but it tells you it's misbehaving so you can control it. That was a good rev match. I am not qualified to tell you exactly how the suspension is on this car, to tell you where the limits are, because, well, I don't think anyone's qualified to on the British public roads, because you've got to be going far too quickly to be able to find those limits. But it feels incredibly capable. It just feels like you could throw it into a corner at absolutely any speed, and it just kind of does what you want, and it keeps pulling because of that brilliant engine. It just keeps going and going and going and going, and you only start to notice just how fast you're going, if you're not looking at the speedometer, that is. You only start to notice once you start to brake, because once you start trying to slow the car down, you start to notice, oh my God, we're going at some rate of knots here. And when you are trying to stop it, you put your foot on the brakes and suddenly it starts wiggling at you again. You know, it really makes it obvious that you were traveling really quickly, really quickly. So I think the deceleration, it's a little bit less controlled than it is in acceleration. Oh, little pop. over a crest it just kind of rides it so nicely it comes straight back down onto the surface there's no kind of float in it whatsoever it just is there solidly sprung and on a road like this it's all the better for it well the steering is the bit that's surprising me because i fully expected it to be rather horrendous if i'm honest 
I expected it to be completely devoid of any kind of life. But it isn't. It has not just weight behind it, but it has so much feel, so much communication. This car is surprising. Not because it's capable, because with this team behind it, you'd expect it to be. But because of the degree of capable that it is. There are very few modern cars with a shade of the feel that this thing has. I'm so shocked that it has so much feel in it. So shocked. There's a weight and a connection to all of the controls. Gear lever, steering, the clutch, the brakes, everything has that extra heightened sense of feel in it and weight in it that I wouldn't have expected in this. I'd really like to drive a standard i30 to compare it and to see what the difference actually is and whether Hyundai tuned this and did all of these, thing, these things, especially for the i30N. Because I cannot imagine that the standard i30 has an ounce of the communication in the clutch pedal as this does. This is the only modern hot hatch where you get a wriggly, fidgety little car with a five year warranty that also covers track use. This is proper. This is a hot hatch to the nth degree. I am very happy that this has been a success for Hyundai and long may that continue if all of their cars are as good as this. I'd really like to drive an i20N because with a little bit less weight and a little bit less heft, that might be even more fun than the i30 is. This is going to be controversial, but I think that this is the coolest modern hot hatch. And that's because it's completely unashamed in its capabilities. This car doesn't try and hide its credentials. It lays everything out on the table and says, look at my machinery in its finest impression of the Squadron Commander flash art. There may be cars out there that are quicker, but that's unnecessary. There may be better all-rounders, but that's boring. And then, and I am generalising a bit, there are two main rival camps. You have the VAG corner with the Golf GTI and the Bimmer camp with the 1-8 Ti. They're both fine choices and in many ways they may be better cars than this. But the Golf has a self-inflicted problem. Popularity. Sounds strange to say, but the Golf is just common. And I know that it's a good car, but that makes it a cliché. And loads of them are driven by people masquerading as car enthusiasts. I don't see a Golf GTI and ever think, ooh, it's one of us. But I do think it's a bit boring. It just doesn't have a standout wow factor to it like this does, and it certainly doesn't have the engineering sharpness that this does. And then there's a the BMW. The whole attraction of a Bavarian is that it's an ultimate driving machine, and traditionally that stood for six cylinders and rear wheel drive. But the F41 series doesn't have either of those features, so they need to find a new raison d'etre. And the 128 Ti may be the beginning of that, but the front end being as ugly as sin doesn't help with the reinvention. I do like the stance and the decals, but that face, blur. And that leads me on to Hyundai's raison d'etre, because this car appears to have set a standard that the Koreans have maintained over the last half a decade, and that's producing cars with very few stylistic compromises. The brashness of this and the space age cross with 80s-ness of the Ionic 5 are signs that there's something special happening. While the stalwarts of the automotive industry are hiccuping and producing some very average looking cars, Hyundai are doing the opposite. If we ever see that Envision 74 Coupe thing, then I will say the words. But for now, Hyundai are working on producing some of the coolest cars on the market. And on that note, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please do click like and subscribe to TwinCam as well. I'm forever indebted to my wonderful Patreon supporters, so if you'd like to support me that way, then please do follow the link in the description. And I'll have more videos 
coming along soon.